are you seeing signs of inflation beginning to increase? We're seeing very substantial inflation. It's very interesting. I mean, it, it, we're raising prices. People are raising prices to us. It's being accepted. I mean, it's not. If you own a home, though, with a very large mortgage and you have incredible inflation, it wipes out the mortgage and you still have the home. I mean, it just. It, In it, Weimar, Germany, they gave you the mortgage back at the end. It's very interesting. That's the one thing that is right. Um, and, you know, the best investment at all, of all, I mean, if you're the leading brain surgeon in town or the leading lawyer in town or the whatever it may be, you don't have to keep re-educating yourself to be that in current terms. You bought your expertise when you went to medical school or, or law school in old dollars and you don't have to keep reinvesting. Uh, and you retain your earning power in current dollars. I had started investing when I was 11. I just dithered away until when I was seven and eight and nine. But so unfortunately, I didn't get started until I was 11. But I bought my first stock when I was 11, and then I experimented with a whole bunch of things, the timing of stocks and charting and doing all these crazy things. It was a lot of fun. Profitless, but a lot of fun. And I did that until I was 19. And I read all the books on investing in the public library, and just I ate it up. It was fascinating to me, but I had no framework. I was just searching for something. I was hoping that little things on a chart would tell me something about what a stock was going to do. I mean, it was kind of crazy, but everybody else was doing it, so I figured I'd do it too. Uh, sometimes you turn the chart upside down, you know, it still wouldn't help. Then in, in 1949, I read The Intelligent Investor by Ben Graham. I'd never heard of him up till then. And there are really only two chapters in that book that are the key to it. But they set my philosophical framework for investing in three ways. They're so basic and so simple, hard to understand how they could be that important, but the Ten Commandments are simple. You know, it, it, the first is that a stock is part of a business. I mean, you, you can't think of a stock as something different. It's, you value a business, and then you divide by the shares outstanding. But what you have to think about is what kind of a business are you getting into, what are its economic characteristics, who are its competitors, what's its management like, all of these things that relate to a business instead of a little ticker symbol. I used to know when I was 11 or 12, the ticker symbols of every company virtually on the New York Stock Exchange. I could mark the boards and tear us up, you know, but I didn't know anything. I mean, I could, you know, I knew that X was US Steel and G was AT and T and so on, but I didn't, I didn't know anything. I didn't know what was behind them. So I had to start looking at, at these little symbols or these little names in the paper as businesses and decide how do you value a business? What counts? The second thing in that, in, in the book is that Graham gives you a marvelous set point in terms of how the investor should react to stock market fluctuations. He talks about his mythical Mr. Market in chapter eight. And there's been no better thing written in terms of the investor's attitude toward stock prices. Most people react the wrong way to stock prices. I mean, they feel good when their stocks go up, they feel bad when they go down. They think the stock market is there to instruct them. And Mr. Market is this partner you have in investing. You know, he's a remarkably obliging partner. This guy comes around every day and he tells you what he'll pay you for your interest in the business or what he'll sell you more at the same price. Nobody ever does that in, in, in private business. If you, own, you and I owned a gas station together and I said, every day I want you to come in and offer me your half interest in the station and I can either buy your half or sell you my, my half at the same price and you have to come in every day and do it, you'd be at a terrible disadvantage. And you'd be at a particular disadvantage if you're Mr. Market in the market, because Mr. Market, our, our friend of the market, who obligingly gives you those figures every day, different figures at the end of the day and the start of the day, but he's naming a price at which you'll either buy or sell. The beautiful thing about him is that this guy is an alcoholic manic depressive. I mean, he, I mean, he is as unsound as they come. He wanders around all day you know, uh, and looks at the crazy things, and he, you know, he, he, he's going to name all kinds of crazy prices. And you don't have to pay any attention to them, except when it's to your advantage to do so. That's once a year, once every five years, it's one stock out of 3,000. All you have to do is sit there. You have no moral responsibility to this jerk. You know, I mean, he is naming these numbers. You didn't ask him to, but he's doing it. And all you have to do is pick the one time when he is particularly depressed or particularly manic or particularly drunk or whatever it may be. And the market will be all of those things. And and you take advantage of it. And that's what's remarkable about stocks, if you think about it, is that if you look at the high and low on all of these American companies for the last year, you'll see case after case after case where the high is twice the low. 
Now that's for a sound American business, is running along, paying people, selling goods, and so on. If you go out and look at farmland 10 miles from here, there's no way in the world over a year that the farmland is going to range in value from X to 2X. It may go from X to 110% of X or vice versa. If you look at an apartment house near here and figures on essentially apartment houses like that over a year, it won't, it won't move 10% in a given year. But here are the finest of American businesses and people just name these numbers that go all over the place. And you don't have to play except when you want it. That's the important thing. And that's, the, that's what Graham tells you. The market isn't there to instruct you, to tell you anything. The market is there just basically to serve you when you want it to serve you. you know, one of the most important things to remember in stocks, very hard to do, but people have all these feelings about it. The stock doesn't know you own it. You know, you're sitting there with these certificates for Berkshire. The company doesn't even know you own it. You know, and the stock doesn't, it's trading now and they don't know you own it. So it has no feelings about you. I mean, you've got all these feelings about it, but it's just part of a business. If Berkshire is worth 75,000 times a million and a half shares, you know, roughly 110 billion or something like that, it's a good investment. If it isn't, it's a lousy investment. You know, and you have to value the business. And Graham, you know, it's amazing, but people don't do that in Wall Street. You, bet, you, you hear price targets or that kind of thing, but you'd see no one write a paper that says, here is the nature of this business over the next 20 years. You know, what will that, what should that business sell for? Forget about what it's selling for. In fact, one of the things I always like to do when I'm looking at investments is I like to look at them without knowing the price. Because if you see the price, it automatically has some influence on you. If you just sit down with the reports, if I get an idea about looking up a company and I get the 10Ks and so on, I would rather not know the price because I'd rather value it without knowing the price. When I used to handicap horses when I was a kid, one of the things I would do is I'd get the racing form ahead of time. And if there were nine horses in a race, we'll say, obviously the probabilities of, of each one winning the race had to add up to 100%. I mean, one horse was going to win the race after the dead heat, or all of them dropping dead on the backstretch. So if you went through the racing form, and I would look at the third race at Hialeah, I would try to figure out the percentage chance of each horse winning the race, and that had to add to 100%. Then I would compare those percentages to the odds. But I, first of all, I wouldn't look at the odds first. I would look at the past performance and all that thing first. Stock market's the same way. Third thing in Graham's book is the margin of safety. If you come up to a bridge and it says capacity 10,000 pounds and you're driving a 9,800 pound truck, you drive down further and find another bridge. I mean, you know, they, nobody knows exactly what, what that capacity is and it may have been, sign may have been put up three years ago. So you always leave a margin of safety. You don't try to cut things that close. You wait till something kind of shouts at you in the stock market. And uh, with those three principles, you can build all kinds of, all kinds of structures on that. But that's the foundation. And if you've got that in mind, and that's in the intelligent investor, I've never found anything that remotely compares with it. All three of the ones I just, you can't get rid of one leg of the three-legged stool and, and still have a, a good investment philosophy. But I would say that uh, the most important thing uh, over a long period and working with big money uh, is to understand the business.